Good evening. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education work session on Wednesday, October 21st. I'd like to start first with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. I'd like to start with a motion to amend uh, the agenda to include 4.01 grants. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for a vote on the motion to amend the agenda to include 4.01 grants. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Uh, do I have a motion to accept the amended agenda as presented? 4.02. 4.02, yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Under information item. Okay. Thank you. Do I have a motion to accept the amended agenda? So moved. So moved. Second. First and a second. Thank you. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the amended agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. I'd like to announce uh, Ms. Vanessa Bass is the uh, secretary for the board. Um, for this meeting only, and we thank you very much for sitting in. We appreciate it. And Ms. Pullen, Ms. Fellers, gentlemen in the back, thank you for joining us. Uh, first presentation tonight is our Board of Education Building Feasibility Report. Good evening, President Harper and members of the board. For the record, my name is Carla Pullen. I am currently serving as the Interim Chief Operating Officer for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Our team is here together this evening to review the final report for the feasibility study for the Board of Education Central Office Building. We do understand that all of our energies are focused on much, much bigger tasks and challenges at this particular time. Um, with that being said, this is one of our open capital projects that we need to close out and we're here this evening to give you a report of this feasibility study as part of that process. If you'll recall, last winter, we initiated a study of the central office building to determine the efficiencies and the cost implications of a building renovation here or the construction of a new building. The building facility assessment that we completed on this building in 2016 did identify some very major deficiencies in the plumbing systems, in the HVAC, in our lighting throughout the building, the building envelope, windows and doors, as well as the brick, deficiencies with the roof, and ADA compliance throughout. To bring this building up to par is going to require upwards of $4 million, and within the next 10 years, we're looking at at least $6 million that would help us to complete the deferred maintenance that we've encountered. We determined that we would look at three different options for this feasibility study. The first is a complete renovation of the existing building with Anchor Points Academy remaining at its current location out back. The second option was a renovation of this building with additional space added inside so that we could incorporate Anchor Points here within this envelope. And the third option is the idea for a new building. So here with me this evening is Mr. Jeremy Klein and Mr. Rick Kaplonis of WGM Architects. They were awarded the contract for this study and they're gonna give us an overview of the methodology that they use to come up with our spatial requirements for a renovation or new building. They're also gonna update you on the overall cost implications for each of the options and we'll look at how those dollar values were derived. So, gentlemen. Carla, can I ask you one question? Sure. Maybe it's in my mind, but didn't we discuss at some point maybe Centerville Middle School possibly being? That's a possibility as well. So as we undertake the feasibility study for Centerville Middle School, we're also going to be looking at what the reuse of that building would entail. But we're not going to go too far with this project until we come with all our information. Correct. I mean, it just, because right. we have that building renovated and maybe possibly the board of it there would save us having to build a new building. That's potential, yes, yes. Thank you.
Thank you, Carla, and thank you all for having us here today. I am Jeremy Klein with WGM Architects, uh, presenting with Rick Kleponis, um, both principals at WGM. A little sidebar, uh, anytime we have the opportunity to do a project for Queen Anne's County, and specifically Queen Anne's County Public Schools, um, we're very excited to do so. We're both county residents. I have three children in the school system. Um, so anything that we can do to participate to help you make your decisions, you know, we take it very seriously and, and uh, we hope that it's helpful. Thank you, sir. This report, I think Carla um, presented the background really well, and I want to focus again on the backdrop of the EMG study that you had performed in 2016. That was really a facilities condition assessment of all of your uh, properties. And as she pointed out, you're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood north of $6 million in deferred maintenance between now and mid-2030, 2037. Um, so that's the backdrop for this report. Um, evaluating potential reuse of this building with a more extensive renovation that will bring it forward um, for the next several decades or potential uh, building a new building on an alternate site. For this report, because you have the backdrop of the EMG report, that really focuses on the physical condition of this building. So this report doesn't really focus on physical condition. Um, it instead focuses on the sufficiency of this building to meet your programmatic needs. So what does that mean? It is the departments that are contained uh, herein, obviously over time have sort of been uh, fit here in the spaces uh, that work. This building was not originally designed as an office building, it was designed as a school, um, obviously. Our civil engineer on this project went to, to middle school in this building. Um, but it's not ideally suited as, as an office building. So the methodology uh, we look at is to number one, determine your current and future programmatic requirements, in this case through 2030. We identify then uh, the space that's required to meet those programmatic requirements. And then we do, we'll call it test fits within the building to see how those uh, programmatic needs could be allocated. Um, or in the third option, uh, allocated in a, in a potential new building. So to accomplish that process, the first thing that we do is, with Ms. Pullen's assistance, uh, reach out to all of the departments within the public school system. Uh, through a worksheet, we ask them to identify um, current and future staffing needs, again, through 2030, as well as ancillary support spaces um, that would be required to support that particular department. Um, we solicit that feedback. Once all those sheets are received back, we apply a series of space standards um, to those sheets. So that would be assigning square footages based on uh, type and size of offices, as well as square footages to different type of ancillary support spaces. That yields a net program number. This is the square footage that you need to meet the programmed requirements that you've stated. We apply an efficiency factor to that, which accounts for um, the unprogrammed type of spaces, so circulation corridors, restrooms, stairwells, thickness of walls, all of those types of things. And then we end up with a total required gross square footage um, that's required for, for each of uh, the departments. When we tabulate that all together, we end up in this column with the program net square footage and the overall space needs uh, based on the, the feedback that we were given from all the departments. And what that yields is a space need using a standard efficiency factor for an offense building, a gross space need of just under 44,000 square feet. When you reverse engineer that, if you look over in this existing column, you can see uh, the number one takeaway is, okay, this building is big enough to meet that, that space need. This building is 47,650 gross square feet. 
But as we reverse engineer that and run that back, you can also see when you're looking at efficiency factors in this column here, the building multiplier, the higher that multiplier gets, the less efficient the building is. So what that yields is, yes, we're in this space, we're not in here super efficiently, and that makes sense. You have much wider corridors than you would need in an office building. The rooms are sized to be classrooms, not offices, et cetera, et cetera. We take the programmed square footage and then we can reallocate and reapply that within this building, which we did uh, in two options. And then also a number of test fits on a, a new site. We're only gonna present one of those to you um, today in terms of the new building scenario. Uh, the piece of property that was evaluated for a new uh, building scenario is across from Centerville High School, adjacent to the county office building. Um, that parcel would be under the purview of the town of Centerville from a regulatory standpoint, um, where you'd build your building there. So we went as a courtesy to the Planning Commission in June, and we presented these new building concepts to them. So the one that you'll see today and the one that makes it into the front section of the report is the one that they feel is most successful according to their town guidelines. Um, that is kind of the general overview of, of what we're doing. With that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Rick Claponis, who will take you a little more uh, in detail about each of the three schemes, and then I'll come back at the end and we can, we can look at the costs. Thanks. Sir, would you um, use one of the wipes, please, and wipe the... Yep. That's all right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you? Can I take this off? Sure. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, and I'm Rick Laponis. Uh, um, as Jeremy said, another Queen Anne's County resident and uh, excited to be here too. So um, what uh, I'm going to get into is uh, those three options that Jeremy uh, um, suggested. Uh, the first option, uh, we were looking at maintaining this building. And um, as you also said, this was originally a school building uh, that in that it was not very a, a very efficient school building as it was originally built in the early uh, 1900s and then with some additions on the back in the mid 20th century um, the additions on the back are um, the, obviously you pretty aware of what's going on there there's uh, one story spaces that uh, um, hold all of your uh, ancillary and your um, storage areas and your delivery areas and your transportation and and uh, your facilities offices. Um, what uh, we looked at as the, the first option, and here's your existing plan, uh, very chopped up, um, utilizing the, the existing wide corridors of the old school. There's more, more egress stairs than you need, and uh, albeit they're not even code compliant. And, uh, uh, your second floor has uh, some other more chopped up areas with uh, wide corridors. Um, we, uh, we did some uh, ev uh, evaluation of the existing conditions of the mechanical systems, mechanical electrical plumbing systems, um, which were uh, done by Alban Engineering, our MAP consultants. And they uh, evaluated what was going on uh, with the systems and uh, proposed new systems um, as an overhaul to the building uh, from that standpoint, bringing it up to code, bringing it up to more efficient and uh, uh, better uh, types of systems for a, an office building, including uh, fire alarm, uh, electrical distribution, lighting, uh, all new uh, plumbing fixtures, uh, new restrooms, ventilation systems, cooling and heating systems, obviously getting rid of all the, your, your window air conditioners for cooling. Uh, question, sir. Mm -hmm. How did you <clears throat> integrate that with our, our, our um, study that we already did, the assessment study there? Um, we've, we've taken that into account. Uh, those, uh, that's part of the, the study was replacing those, those, uh, those systems. That's why 
essentially the uh, when we were saying the cost of, of deferred um, modifications and renovations of six million dollars over the next 20 years that's included in that and um, uh, the actual the, the, the cost estimate we did put together includes escalation costs as well uh, going down that down that road so okay. uh, it didn't really uh, the, that report didn't really give you um, 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 systems to consider this report does give you systems um, what are, are most um, uh, the most uh, likely to be uh, installed into this uh, building so that was that was basically a snapshot of where we were at the time yeah in year yeah, they, they were basically saying that the systems were, were in not very good condition and uh, needed to be replaced and, you know, have so much of a life left on them. So, and that's why it was deferred. They figured at some point down the line, the um, uh, they're going to need to be uh, replaced. And that's where you, you came in with how that would be on yeah, the and, and all that. And uh, with the renovation, with an overall renovation, um, basically we're, we would address the whole envelope of the building, a uh, new window which was included as well but uh, that report um, would upgrade the building from an envelope standpoint um, the report uh, or the, the feasibility study addresses the building to make it more efficient to make it uh, uh, bring it up to standards for you know 20th century uh, 21st century <laughs> office buildings and uh, school facilities so uh, when when we get into all of those things uh, we're trying to make it as, as efficient as possible, including obviously uh, getting the program spaces in, um, bringing, and I was just saying, I was gonna say, in this first and in least invasive um, option, we're basically keeping the building as it is, where we'll modify, move around uh, existing part or existing partitions, leave all the structural elements of the building in place. Uh, we'll try to bring in, uh, uh, eliminate two of the two of the uh, portables in the back by bringing Comtech and uh, PFY into the building and consolidating everybody so everybody's in the same in the same building. There's more uh, synergies uh, amongst departments in the building and. Um, and then obviously getting rid of a couple of portables, uh, which are part of those maintenance programs down the road too. So getting rid of the portables is a you know a long-term um, necessity as well. So uh, so when you're looking at this first least invasive uh, revitalization, we're basically just staying within the building, bringing some uh, other departments in, rearranging some things to make things more efficient. And um, uh, again, we're, we'll, we'll kind of bleed into the, the wide corridors, but the, you can, there's only so much you can do in those wide corridors. They're about um, you know 12 to 15 feet wide, so you still have to maintain your exits and things like that. We did do uh, co uh, code analysis as well in doing this, but when you look at the um, the advantages of a, le a lesser invasive approach. Um, you're basically, obviously, you're you're keeping your building, so it's from that standpoint, it's the most sustainable option or approach because it's an adaptive reuse. Excuse me. When all this is going on theoretically in here, mm -hmm. where are the people who are working in here going to do their work? Well, that's that's part of the things that, that come with that. It's uh, number two. Who owns the property that this building sits on? This is this building. Who owns this building? Yeah. Who owns the property in the building? This is the Board of Ed, right? Board of Education. Okay. And uh, Centerville owns the property out there. Correct. Why don't we consider building a building out there for the administration, tearing this down and swapping this land for that land and not paying for it? Uh, I come at things that, from a much different part. Oh, sure. Um, and that's an idea for consideration in the future. Address that when I come back up too, and one of the reasons we opted not to look at that as one of the options. I, I remember the Stevensville Middle School renovation, and there were huge surprises. And anytime you try to renovate a building this age, there will be surprises here. The best you could possibly do, there's still gonna be expensive run-ons. I, 
everybody can come to their own conclusion, but I, it's pretty, pretty stuck in my head that we build out there, tear this down. Yes, uh, you were a county commissioner and uh, Captain Kelly and I were board members during that time frame. And yes, we remember very well right. the surprises. Right, well, obviously on any type of renovation, especially with a building that's over 100 years old, you're gonna find surprises. And that's what we take in, into account when we're looking at these things. We're not gonna run into a historical society problem tearing it down, are we? It's, uh, well, it's not an historic register, but it is in a, a historic um, District area. District of Centerville. It's Centerville, yeah. But it's not, the building itself is not on the, on okay. the register, so. That's the good thing. Mr. Anderson, if we vacate this building, we revert it back to the county commissioners. So at that point, it won't be our decision necessarily. What we did with Sellersville. <coughs> Just like we did with Sellersville, middle, the old Sellersville Middle School, we reverted that back to the county commissioners. Okay. So Ms. Jarrett wasn't very happy to get that. <laughs> well, that, that's I one of the things. Like, yes. What are we going to do with this? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, I think that was what he said. <laughs> uh, you're just giving us your problems. The only thing I got to say is we've got you know a lot of issues there that are beyond this board with the alumni association just being a high school since. 196 or 18, whatever time it was. But I think we just let's jump and go through because we got a lot of important information that this public needs to see tonight. And this is some of it, but not the majority of it. Okay. So I just hope we can get to through this thing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Just to say quickly, with, you know, there are our advantages to this, uh, obviously, and uh, but there's a lot of disadvantages. Uh, one of them is what happens to the displacement of, of uh, the folks that work here. There's a, you would have to do some type of phasing program of construction, uh, possibly putting people in other portables and things like that. But, but that's uh, incorporated in uh, the cost to do this. How much asbestos has been used in this building? Uh, there's been used or removed. Yeah. No, uh, it, that's in here now that we don't know about. There, there, it, part of the part of that uh, study um, identified there is some asbestos in here, so there would be some asbestos abatement uh, uh, incorporated in that uh, project as well. So it's not it's not invasive, but there are areas with it. So I mean, you have lead paint too. So um, you have lead paint. Okay. Be expensive. <clears throat> Let's move on. Um, so the. Uh, this is the first option. Um, uh, obviously, we can get at the whole program, the whole programmed uh, um, study into this building. And uh, but the, so the second uh, option uh, for this building is more invasive, and a more invasive uh, option. Uh, in, in either of these cases, we're not building outside of the building, no additions to the building. But in this case, we would bring the. Uh, the school, the Rise Academy, or Anchors Academy. The uh, Rise. Rise. The Rise. Okay. The <laughs> Rise Academy into the building, um, and basically put it on the back of the building where it would still we'd still use the bus uh, access on the back on the parking lot. Uh, but we can get it in here. Uh, what happens though, we, we do a little more invasive uh, structural modifications to the interior of the building and we uh, ex essentially uh, bleed out into the corridors again. Uh, we, we capture spaces like, uh, like the stair, uh, one of the exit stairs that's not required and use that for interior space as well. So um, essentially we're getting to this point, uh, as Jeremy was mentioning, uh, the the current uh, efficiency of the building is about 1.8 uh, a multiplier. The uh, first approach, uh, the least in, lesser invasive approach, is about 1.7 multiplier, and this gets you down to about 1.6 multiplier in efficiency. Um, basically, you have the same same types of advantages and disadvantages as you do in the first one with. Uh, uh, again, advantages, sustain, most sustainable, you have existing utilities, uh, your modernization can create a fresh environment for everybody. Uh, ideally, it's a lesser cost, but it's a lesser cost from a square footage cost standpoint, a cost per, con cost per square foot construction, and your uh, portables uh, would be eliminated. Uh, but the disadvantages, uh, aside from the new work, uh, the building would still not be totally code compliant. Uh, the building envelope would not be totally energy efficient. Uh, because of the insulation in the in the walls that are not that is not there, 
uh, displacement of personnel, the phase occupied construction that would require uh, an extended construction time period. Uh, the building circulation efficiency is still not that great. Uh, exterior materials and um, uh, the building exterior building materials, even though it's not historic, we would probably maintain the same type of materials, which are still uh, require maintenance over over time. Um, and uh, there's going to be a lot of demolition and waste. So basically, that's the the two versions we looked at to keep this building uh, and on for the board of ed. Um, which one of those was the one that Centerville bought into? I mean, the Centerville Town bought it. No, that, that's for the new building. He's about to talk about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. So yeah, uh, for, from their, for their uh, from the town of Centerville standpoint, that's there's nothing really in their purview um, because we're basically staying within the footprint. We have a little bit of site work to do in the back uh, because of the. Uh, uh, taking out the uh, portables, but there is there is no stormwater management on the on the site, so that would kind of uh, be status quo there as well. So. Okay, thank you. Um, looking at uh, the new building on Vincent Street, uh, again, it's basically between the uh, Queen Anne's County Office Building and the Queen Anne's County High School. Um, there's uh, the build. The site is actually uh, split with uh, uh, a zoning uh, R2 uh, on the north side and uh, C2 on the south side, and uh, there uh, you can build this building within both zones. But uh, there are some requirements uh, or special exceptions or waivers that might occur uh, for either of those um, zoning areas. Uh, uh, from a site standpoint, uh, the existing building or the or existing site is pretty much uh, flat and has been actually prepared for for a, uh, a construction site. It's uh, um, nothing there that uh, that would uh, deem anything uh, not buildable. Uh, the the utilities are are there on Vincent Street that they can tie into. Stormwater management would be maintained on the site. And uh, we uh, basically keep everything within those uh, within our setbacks on the site uh, on the north side of the site. Um, uh, when we did some uh, studies, we essentially started the studies uh, doing test fits for a footprint to make to see uh, to validate the uh, uh, the footprint and the. Uh, and the square footage that uh, our, our target was, which uh, would maintain a one about a 1.35, 1.36 multiplier, which is uh, basically in the in the um, in the neighborhood of the typical office building standards uh, for for office buildings. But uh, we looked at positioning the building on the north end of the site uh, to uh, preserve anything on the south end for the site for any further development. And uh, our initial meeting with Chris Jakubiak with the, the town planner for Centerville, uh, we, we talked about uh, pushing the, the, the building up to the northern, the northern end and keeping uh, 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 an edge, or almost a quasi-urban edge along Ruthsburg Road. Um, there's the, the, the town planning and zoning is in, in the process of developing um, their, uh, their um, planning for this uh, access coming in Roosburg Road, route, route 304 from 301, as this might be the, the entrance into the town uh, from the main artery of 301. Um, so we talked about that, and uh, this, this footprint essentially addresses Chris Chukubiak's uh, requests, uh, and uh, which would put the, uh, the parking on the south side in the center of the in the center of the uh, the site, uh, which could um, double as more parking or expanded parking for any development on the south side of the site. The in this version here, uh, we had one access point onto the site from a, a vehicular circulation, which would be across from the uh, county office building entrance, and we'd have a loop around parking. Uh, parking lot, and then a, a offshoot for the board of edge, board of ed entrance, and then a separate entrance for the for the Arise Academy. 
Uh, again, we did. Uh, Question one quick. Mm -hmm. Where is the YMCA in relation to that? Uh, where, I'm just wondering. Um, the YMCA is to the southwest Southwest. Okay. of the, uh, basically down it says Little Kidwell Avenue. Yeah. It's to the south of that. It's that little piece there that's southwest of there. So uh, that is one of the things that, uh, you know, we're, we, uh, we'd like to consider this uh, site for because with the synergies to the YMCA, to the Queen Anne's County High School, to the, to the uh, uh, Queen Anne's County uh, office building, a lot of synergies going on there. So, okay. Uh, the so the building itself, the footprint, we looked at uh, by with a basically with a clean slate, uh, we can look at uh, pulling all your departments, uh, consolidating them in one area, uh, looking at how they can uh, uh, interface with other departments and the common areas in the building. Uh, so you're not going up and down. Obviously, one a one-story option is the is what we thought was the most efficient uh, way to look at this. Um, even though it has a larger footprint, um, it, it eliminates any you know vertical circulation in the building, stairs and elevators, and keeps everybody on the same level. Um, and then in addition, uh, the footprint also provides. Uh, natural light to all your spaces uh, and uh, with an ample amount of windows on the perimeter, uh, we'll get that with this and keeping your mechanical and storage spaces on the interior part. Um, obviously, uh, with with your Board of Ed uh, comes this room, your, your um, uh, boardroom, and we'd bring that to right to the f uh, forefront of the building so people don't have to find their way through the building to get to um, one of these meetings. Um, in addition, uh, you'd have uh, your, your Arise Academy and um, your operations and food service area as well off that uh, to, the, to the east side, uh, keeping uh, all your office space um, to the northeast and west sides of the building uh, and have natural light to that. Uh, obviously, the advantages of this, uh, you're going to have a, a brand new code compliant building, an, an environmentally sustainable design, an energy efficient envelope uh, and equipment, uh, minimal maintenance for the new building. Uh, all the materials you'll use here are, are uh, you know, masonry and non, uh, you, know, you don't have to paint things like that. Uh, uh, the building and site are more efficient and address both the route, route, route 304 and Vincent Street. Gives you some uh, uh, exposure from from 30, route 304 as people come in and out of the town. Uh, the personnel, the, the, you know, the staff here is not inconvenienced because they'll just move right into this building. Uh, shorter construction period because of that. Uh, the synergies again with the YMCA, the county office building, and the, and the Queen Anne's County High School, and, uh, and the, the building pad is ready to build on. Uh, and potentially, uh, we you know we would uh, consol by consolidating the Arise Academy, you're going to share your ki kitchen um, and options to include uh, as your option and to with your option to include the Arise Academy. Um, Transfers uh, uh, the existing this this would add, uh, transfer the existing building back to Queen the Queen Anne's County's commissioner this building here so and um, and then uh, again it's a brand new building uh, it would have a longer life to it disadvantages obviously are our new utilities costs uh, a larger uh, building and parking footprint uh, uh, again some minor rezoning uh, items that are required. Uh, and the grading permit process and overall cost may be um, uh, are on the higher side. And again, that is from a cost per square foot from a construction standpoint. Um, again, this this building, uh, the two this building building we're sitting in now is about forty seven thousand square feet, um, and uh, that's what the. It, with the first uh, approach, it would stay 40,000 square feet plus uh, additional uh, nine um, uh, portables that you still have to maintain. Approach number two is you're getting rid of the portables. You're bringing everything into a 47,000 square foot building, so you're, but you're still working throughout the whole building. This, uh, uh, a new building is about 42,000 square feet. And you get everything in this building in 42,000 square feet, and it's more efficient. Is it one floor? It's one floor, right. But it's a safer building. Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, 
And um, so from that standpoint, um, we did some just initial renderings just to give everybody an idea of what the, uh, what the building could look like based on what the zoning uh, requirements and the building covenants require, um, how it would fit into, into this, uh, that area there. Um, again, one story, we'd use the, you know, the brick that's uh, uh, prominent in this area and some other materials that uh, Queen Anne's County is known for. So um, essentially that's, uh, again, uh, when we, we did have a follow-up meeting with the town of uh, Centerville's uh, planning and zoning, um, uh, Chris, Jakubi, Ju Chris Jakubiak, who couldn't make that, um, uh, was uh, not, or, or he wasn't there, but we did talk to the, to the uh, plan uh, the zoning commission and they had some other uh, thoughts about the, the, um, the plan that we came up with. Uh, uh, one of the things was that they'd prefer uh, circulation around the building uh, from a vehicle standpoint. Uh, do try to move it all the way to the north side of the site. Um, uh, two vehicular access points uh, would be better. And uh, the, the, uh, the proposed widening of the Kid Kidwell Road on the north end would not uh, of the site may not be an issue. If not, it would be a positive if the, if the building could be pushed to the north of the, as much as possible. Um, there, are, they had a concern with uh, delivery location, but uh, it was mentioned that there's no tractor trailers that um, approach this site. Basically, some smaller box trucks and the buses that would have uh, easy circulation onto the site. And. Um, uh, well, there was one question about having a, a, a um, an access off of uh, off of uh, Roosburg Road three or four, but the State Highway uh, Administration would probably not per allow that. So uh, basically, your your front would base it would be off of Vincent Street, so or Vincent Road. So um, that, in a nutshell, is the the. Um, um, the, the, the three approaches to um, the feasibility study. Thank you, so, sir. I'll Anybody, any other Jeremy. questions on that? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, what is the decision-making pattern with the timetable? The time does? frame, Ms. Pullen? We're gonna do Bayside first, I mean, pardon me, Centerville Middle first. Yeah, so some of that will be dependent upon what the study um, says to us for Centerville Middle School as well as what funding is available through the state at that particular time. So the, the three options that um, <clears throat> Rick just presented to you, understand, right, these are high level concepts that um, they're not designed, they're a concept that gets you to an idea so you can understand the rough order of magnitude the rough order of magnitude um, that any of these options would cost you. Um, we take those options, we bring them to our cost estimator. And what that yields, as you look at this sheet, is essentially you're in the same neighborhood for all three options, right around $15 million. Um, Rick pointed out that um, the $15 million, you have option one, um, the less invasive renovation of this building, the land's right around 15 million. Option two, where you have more of a, an architectural intervention within these exterior walls, um, puts you about a plus 500,000. Option three, which is the new building, is actually the least expensive, but it's the most expensive from a per square foot standpoint. If you are um, in the low 300s per square foot for the renovations to this building, you're up closer to 350 um, for a new building. But because the new building is smaller, 42 and change thousand square feet as opposed to over 47,000 square feet, the total cost comes in a little bit less. I do, I, I wanna correct one thing um, Rick had said when he started talking. Um, at one point, we did include escalation um, in these rough order of magnitudes. We took it out in this final version because we know that your timeline is not necessarily defined. So it's very hard to put escalation to a number when you don't know how far out you're escalating it. So right now, these numbers are costs as of today um, for each of those for each of those three options. And this is 
all construction. This is not, you know, the evasive measures on our employees who have to move to new sites and get like we had with um, correct. So this middle school where we had that whole building wired, correct. new t telephones, the computers, the whole. I mean, that cost Furniture is not costs. factored into this at all. So you you have if you look down at this line item, there's a phasing and logistics factor, which is building occupied during construction. You have a five percent multiplier that's applied to the first two options here, which is a little north of a half million dollars for each of those. Okay. Um, that would account for some of the construction realities. So there, there's a scenario, there's a potential scenario here because of the space that you have in the building where you could treat this almost like a phased occupied school renovation, which is you would be moving around within the building. You would be temporarily housing people within the building while you renovated certain portions of the building. Um, there's another scenario where you run into, again, uh, using school construction as a, as a corollary where you need to introduce some additional portable space. You, knew, you know that from Stevensville Middle School. Um, so you can get some people out um, while you're renovating. Obviously, one of the major benefits of option three of any new building, whether it's at Vincent Street, whether it's just potentially somewhere back on the site here, is the fact that you could build that building, keep everybody housed here, and not have to incur any of those temporary measures. Vernon Park, Anne Arundel County did. Yep. 100%. The stadium down, built the new school, tore the school down and built the new stadium. Yep. It only cost a quarter of a billion dollars, but you know. I, I do have a question <clears throat> um, for Carla and the okay. funding. Um, for some reason, my brain says that at one point the renovations are always more favorably looked at than the brand news with the state. Is that right? This project is not eligible for state funding, so this would be a county-only contribution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as far as the ability to more easily fund, it would it wouldn't matter right. either way. That's not it. Now it's good. okay. Thank you. Yeah. When, oh, when is the middle school going to be up for looking at the center of middle school? Mm -hmm. So we currently have the funding and are looking at putting that out for contract as well. COVID has slowed that process down a little bit because we can't really study what the processes are of students moving throughout mm -hmm. a building. When you say out for contract, so are we not going to entertain the idea of the board office moving in that building? We are going to look at that as part of the feasibility study there. The difficulty that we have is that there is no other land allotted for Centerville Middle School in terms of the county commissioners and what's available to us. So if we look at moving there, we would have to build another building for sure on that same site, and the site is probably not big enough to house both capacities, to have a school, have all of the play field, have the board office, parking, all of that in that particular Well, I mean, acreage. We, have we looked at an adjoining property like the Haymaker Farm or something? We have asked that question, yes, and we've been told that there is nothing at this point that would be for sale anytime soon that would be utilized for that. Now, that conversation was probably a year or more ago. Good. But my, my only thing is we're talking about this disruption. If we had a new middle school, which would not, dis, not disrupt center of middle, they could still function, build a new middle school, move them to the new school, renovate Centerville Middle to a board office, then move us, you'd have no disruption anywhere. Yes. And uh, I just don't think, I don't know who's making these decisions, but I think it needs to be really looked at harder than, there's always a way and different things you can do. I mean, We've already done it. We built a solar field behind there and took up valuable space. Yes. So, First of know, all, it would be the county commissioners deciding whether they will be able to afford to build a new board office. That is first. If they can afford to build a new board office on Venture Street, they can afford to do do one to Central Middle School. I would. Uh, Centerville Middle would go where this is going. No, Central Middle School would go a new building. I'm just amazed that we let the solar field go on valuable property right behind middle school and high school. But that was not this. My, we weren't here then, I guess, when that decision was made. We were. Yeah. Well, that's a decision that I won't agree with you. I think we put a solar we field were. behind. There was no discussion about it. Really, well, that was a to me a, irresponsible. That point. But yeah. I just think the middle school has Thank merit. You. Thank you for that. Well, but anyway. You can hold me sometimes. The, uh, middle school. Can, it has a gymnasium, I mean, it can be built into the high school. There's a lot of advantages 
areas that need to be looked at. And I just, you know, when we start talking about this, I just don't want this horse to go too far out of the corral Understood. and get it back. And just that's my opinion, only one of five. Well, and if that's the case, if we look at getting a new building for Centerville Middle School, I would be all on board for that. And you and I had already asked about utilizing Centerville Middle as a uh, new board office. Lisa Vasive on all the employees, on the students, don't want to have to go through Stevensville Middle School again. No. And it's unfair to the students. Absolutely. That's what but, we But when I hear about. Carla say, you know, we're planning on the, the school and middle school, once we get too far planned, then all of a sudden it gets to be a done deal. And I just, whoever the powers are, to make it known, you know, discussion here about this. And these are just studies. What we needed was some of this data to give us that information at Centerville Middle Schools on that list too, so that we can make those. But when that's on that list, it's also on that list to, as an option of board office and possibly building a new school rather than a renovation of the yes, Centerville. Yes, that's what will be studied. So Center when does that start? School. When does Center, Center, Centerville so Middle start? So we would hope to start it very soon, but part of what's going to be integral of that study is actually determining how the students and the staff utilize the building it's tough right now with the COVID process to get deep down as deep down as we need to um, I would hope to start it this winter provided that our metrics stay where they need to be the, the key I mean a key thing anytime that you're looking at kind of moving sort of the shell game of things around is if no doubt the most efficient thing to do is to be able to build something new so that you don't have to affect the current population of building. There's no doubt about that. But to be able to do that, you need to have a property that can support whatever the program that you're trying to put on it is, right? So you need, in the case of a Centerville Middle School, when you move into that study, you need a property that is able to support a new Centerville Middle School building. If that's not available or if the current site can't support that, that's a non-starter. It, it, it doesn't exist. You can't so, use this spot that you're discussing across Vincent Street. You couldn't use that to put Centerville Mill in. But we have we have not looked. That wasn't part of this study evaluation. But so you'll you make it a part of the next study. Will be part. Yes. You could potentially Center look at yes. that using the same piece of the same parcel and looking at a middle school. I mean, because 44, well, the parcel that we're feet. talking about is only seven acres. So the parcel that we would propose for the office building would not be large enough for a school building. Right. Right. So that not be zoned correctly, and there are a lot of uh, hurdles. I don't to have. Like that. I don't have the middle school programmatic needs off my head. I don't know exactly what their program is, but my yeah, my expectation is that the that that site. That site at Vincent Street may not be of sufficient size to support a middle school. It, do, it doesn't mean it's not. You can again look at multi-story buildings and things like that, but you need to appropriately accommodate all the site requirements along with the program for the school building. And my guess is that the middle school program is going to be larger than 50,000 square feet. Well, how how big is Mattapique Middle? I mean, we could go up. You just said that we could do something like Mattapeak Middle. Yes. Put that there. It would yes. fit in the footprint. And that's one of the discussions that we're talking about is potentially multi-story yep. for a new Centerville Middle School if it comes to that. But then you have the fields too, which which probably makes it bigger. I mean, there's sport fields. Yeah, I mean, certainly you wouldn't, on that property, you certainly wouldn't fit any fields. So then you look at synergies, you know, can you share with the high school? Is there potential synergies with what the YMCA is doing? Um, there's a lot of things you can do, but it's just to have that starting point, if, if you're going to start looking at a new building, you, you have to start with the property. <laughs> that's, that's the beginning. You well, that's where Mr. Mark's idea comes into play. But if we build a build, the building, you know, put that this out there, tear this down, there's enough space here to put a new middle school. There would be a potential for that, possibly, yes. And that would, you know, and that way there wouldn't be bothering the students, wouldn't be bothering the employees here as far as having Let's to get the it. administrative building dealt with and then say, oh, look, here's this can, property. Why don't we knock this down and build uh, the middle school, the Centerville Middle School or whatever it is. Perfect. There's also another factor. Uh, you have to look at the students available to go to these schools. And I think 
that Stevensville Middle School attendance is going to go down over time, and other and the areas uh, up north are going to go up. So you're going to, you you don't have to spend money. You just bus the kids from place to place. You know that you know as far as building that they will only build to what is the population at that time. And for happen. seven years. And That's then fine. They put it out time. seven years. Callan High School, perfect That's why example. That's you balance it. You yes. We built that. That building was built for only 1,000. We put 1,400 in it. Yes. It, First day. So, yeah, we know. We've been through there. We've done this. Okay. Well, thank you for the scenarios. We appreciate it. Sure. And hopefully whatever, maybe Christmas break, when no one's in the building, they could start it? That's possible, but we really want the people to be in the building. We really want to see how they work together and what the efficiencies are and who needs to deal with who and how the grade levels work amongst one another. And so it's important to have that input, lots of input from our students and from our community and from the staff members. And that's why COVID has created a challenge because it's just difficult to get that data from them right now. Okay. All right, any other questions? Is that it? That's all? Thank you so much. Yep. We appreciate it. Yep. Uh, presentation 2.02, .02, inclement weather. I think that's you too, Ms. Carla. That is me as well. Thank you. So some of you may recognize the inclement weather procedure uh, presentation that has been done. Uh, we think it's very important now that we are coming upon inclement weather season that we let the public and all of our staff and our families know what the process is and everything that goes into making a decision as to whether we're going to delay or we're going to close the buildings for the day. You surprised us with a five o'clock call this morning. We did. So this morning was our first inclement weather of the season. Um, and I will talk to you a little bit about the challenges that we have this year based on when we are in the buildings as opposed to what we see in normal years. So the purpose, we're going to talk about inclement weather. We have a number of different sources of weather information. We have subscriptions to AccuWeather. We look at the National Weather Service forecasts. We look at our local media outlets. We look at the Weather Channel. We contact MEMA. We look at Weather Underground website, and that begins the evening before. So Margaret Ellen and her transportation team are constantly monitoring weather, whether it be for snow or ice or even fog as we saw this morning. She provided me with a text last night about 8 o'clock that said we may be expecting fog, so be ready at 4 o'clock to start to discuss it. There are also different forecast models that we rely on. The North American Mesoscale, Global Forecast System, um, Rapid Update Cycle, these are some of the different um, models that you'll see used, especially during hurricane season, that help to predict what we're going to see in weather patterns. Can I assume that somebody puts all this together and has a recommendation and they take it to the superintendent and the superintendent says, press the button. That's correct. That's correct. So in the morning, our transportation team start very early, about 3 a.m., talking to the Maryland State Police. They deal with the Centerville Barracks, so we know that the information that they're getting is local to our area. We talk to the Sheriff's Office, to Emergency Management, and DES, so we know people that are on the street are actually seeing what's happening. Public Works, Department of Parks, uh, Maryland State Highway. We have spotters that are county bus drivers both uh, county and contracted drivers that do spotting for us in the morning. So if we anticipate, like we did this morning, that there's fog around 3 a.m., they're starting to ride their areas and see exactly what's happening in different parts of the county. We also have access to all of the state highway traffic cameras for 50 and 301, as well as the Bay Bridge, so we can see what's happening. And then we have our exterior cameras, so we look at our parking lots, we look at our sidewalks to see if they're starting to be clear, especially in a snow event, to make sure that we're ready for students. What does the message say? 
the message. Just a beep, beep, beep. Uh, it's, it's school, very simple. Schools will start later and so forth. That is the intent, yes. Um, we found this morning, and of course, with it being our first one of the season, that the television stations were not picking up our message quite as clearly as they had in the past. And that was partly because they were used to us doing a 90-minute delay. And today, that isn't what we proposed. So typically, yes, we try to keep the message very succinct, very easy to understand. And we're going to be looking at how to um, make that a little bit more accessible in the future as well. How is that used beyond weather? In terms of our messaging system, it's used for all different types of school events. So we utilize School Messenger first as one of the um, <coughs> our devices that will place telephone calls, it will send emails, and that's what we utilize for. It's also used by schools if they need to get information out about important deadlines or um, even sometimes that report cards are coming home just to alert parents. There are temperature and visibility readings that are done. Um, we have 14 different sites where these uh, readings are taken so we can tell if there's fog, if we have a one or two mile visibility. We also look at temperature so we can see if there are differences from South County to North County and vice versa. Here's a map of our weather spotters. Again, these are contracted employees as well as our county bus drivers that are out there looking at the situations in the air area and giving the transportation department their feedback to make sure that we're seeing things in real time and they're getting real notes back to us about what the weather conditions in their area are. Here's our timeline for a delay or closing. This is what happens in a standard school year. And the reason that I'm sharing this is because potentially before we do this again next year, we could be back to a full day. That would be the hope, I think, of everyone. So at 3.30 a.m. is when the process begins. Transportation starts gathering all of the information we just mentioned. By 4.40 a.m., that decision has to be made as to whether or not we are going to delay or we're going to close school. At 5 a.m., the notifications start. So this goes out via school messenger. It goes out to our social media sites. Phone calls, emails start to be placed. At 6 a.m. on a normal day, we have students starting to board our buses. So that's why this process has to happen as quickly as it does. If we're still experiencing inclement weather at 7 a.m., then that decision needs to be made if schools are gonna close or if we're gonna remain on that delay that we've already called. On a 90-minute delay, that at 7.30 a.m., that is when students are gonna start boarding the buses. So 6 a.m. on a typical day, 7.30 a.m. when we have a 90-minute delay. And by 10 a.m., if, if we have students in the building and we opt to make an early dismissal to get all of the buses and to get everyone notified in the timely manner that they need to, we need to have that decision made by 10 a.m. Because at 11.30, 11.45, we have buses coming to take pre-K students home and bring afternoon pre-K students back. So it's quite a process that has to halt in the middle of the day if we do have inclement weather after we've gotten students So in the all building. the buses have to be decontaminated between pre-K and those that get on and so Yes. Forth. So we have now entered the age of hybrid learning. And our inclement weather policy is going to look a little bit different during the time we have some students in the building and some students learning virtually. The process essentially starts at the same time. We're making decisions as we did this morning. Transportation is up and looking at this at 3.30 a.m. 4.40 a.m., again, that decision needs to be made. Right now, in hybrid learning, are we closing school altogether? As some of you mentioned during the last meeting, if there's a potential for hurricane force winds or if we're experiencing a blizzard and we don't believe we are going to have internet access or uh, ac access to power, that would be a day that we would look at doing a full closure of the buildings. We do have the virtual learning platform at this point, so we can, at this point, revert to virtual learning during some of our inclement weather days. If there's internet access. If there is internet access. Otherwise, we'll be using it as, as a snow day. Correct. Okay. 
and that would be a full closure. But you're going to get to if the kids are in the school and we have to dismiss early. So that yes, I will I will discuss that. So what we are doing right now with small group instruction. So we have small groups of students that are currently learning face to face within the buildings. The policy that we have implemented right now is only applicable to the students that are in school for small group instruction. Everyone else is continuing with their virtual learning as regularly scheduled. So in the event of inclement weather, as we had this morning, small group instruction goes virtual. Anybody that would have been coming to our building this morning would stay in a virtual capacity. The change that we have on a Wednesday is that we have 200 CTE students in different cohorts coming to Queen Anne's County High School to get some of their lab time and some of the face-to-face -face instruction that they need. So with a morning delay, a 90-minute delay, it leaves very little time for cohorts W1 and W2 to get any face-to-face -face learning. So in that event, we have them attend school virtually for the day. When it's necessary to delay, W1 and W2 stays home and they log in virtually. W3 and W4, our afternoon cohorts, then came to Queen Anne's County High School this afternoon once it was safe to move our buses around. All other students for the entire day attended virtually. In the event that we have inclement weather and we have to do an early dismissal, we only have students in the building right now for the morning half. So therefore, unless we started to see a rain or snow event or something that we had to dismiss very, very soon after they arrived, we would just be dismissing at 11.15 a.m. our one and two cohorts, and then cohorts three and four would attend virtually in the afternoon. So it's really the Wednesday program during small group instruction that is most greatly affected. So when the children are face to face on Monday and Tuesday, um, they're the same cohort is in the building all day. Or are we having children in in the morning and out uh, and then another cohort in and then out at the end of the day? The proposed schedules at 50% capacity only bring students back in for face to face learning in the morning hours, so 8 to 12 or 9 to 1. The afternoon will be uh, for virtual learning only. And that's every school? That's every school at this point. There is a potential with one of our elementary schools that we are looking at the possibility of a pilot program to see about doing some full day instruction. How is that possible with bus schedules instead of letting everyone have two full days of school? From my understanding, the difficulty with having the full days of school revolves around number one, transportation, and number two, staffing schedules. So if you have staff in front of students in the morning, then they have to allot some time in the afternoon to be with our virtual students. So it doesn't work at every building that they have the staff at this point that they're able to allocate. With one of our elementary schools, we have had some discussions because they feel that they have additional staff that would be available to do all of their virtual students, and therefore they could allot some of their teachers to full-time learning. So these things aren't in stone yet because the biggest cry we're hearing from teachers is they can't get home in time to get their own children. So if it was a full day of school, that problem may be alleviated Okay, well, we're, we're getting off course on what we're talking about right now. Yes. But if a schedule changes, this is all going to change. Mm -hmm. That's change. correct. This will change, and I'll get into that in just a second. Okay. Uh, keep in mind, on a, normal, on a normal schedule, we have some additional bus routes that have to be considered. So we have our uh, RISE Academy out back. We have students that are coming to... Uh, Centerville for the CTE classes. We have the fire school that houses both Ken Island High School and Queen Anne's County High School students. We have special needs buses that go out of county to Baltimore and some places greater. Uh, the annex <coughs> from Ken Island High School goes to, or, um, the Ken Island High School annex at Mattapique Middle School has to go to the main campus for different classes. In a normal year, we would see athletic events, we would see field trips, we would see late buses. Right now, we are not dealing with those at some point we may be. 
Again, notice of the decision, school messenger. We post everything on our website, on our Facebook page. QAC TV runs all of our decisions for delay or closings. We have several television stations that we provide the information to, as well as several radio stations. And Code Blue and Code Red are codes for the employees. Code blue, it's up to you. Code red, stay in bed. This is how we think we will be able to utilize some special instruction to our staff, whether we are doing a full closure day, code red, or whether we are doing the code blue, up to you, and who is able to make it into the buildings on what would have been a typical delay. So a teacher would say it's up to me, so my driveway is filled, I can't leave, but our students show up and there's no teacher. And if you'll allow me, I'll get to that in just a second because yeah. we do have a lot of we do have a lot of questions that are going to come up with our 50% oh, capacity. Are already being answered, so I'm not worried. <laughs> so a lot of times we get questions: Why do we not open in this county in zones? We have 372, close to 372 square miles of land from the Chesapeake Bay that goes all the way to the Delaware line. We transport upwards of 7,800 students in a regular year on 80 plus buses, and we do 11,000, over 11,000 miles. We have a two tier bus system. So some of our buses that are used on tier one are also utilized on tier two, and it makes it very difficult then to intermingle and or change because those buses are utilized for two different runs, not just one. We have the CTE classes and different shuttles that we're running to both our Arise Academy and to the CTE classes. And if we were to look at opening in zones, it has been studied many times. It has been ruled out. We definitely need to purchase additional buses. We need many more drivers to be able to accomplish something like that. Other factors are that we have many high school students that drive every day. We want to make sure that we're making the best decisions about inclement weather to keep them safe. We look at Queen Anne's County Public Works, Centerville Public Works, and State Highway and how quickly they're able to remove snow, keep our roads clear. We look at Queen Anne's County Public School parking lots and how quick our partners that help us to remove snow from there are able to get out. And we look at home and business owners and how fast they're able to shovel snow. In a large event, they may not be getting out to clear our sidewalks and therefore we are not allowing our students to safely travel, especially those by foot. There is a school delay and closing committee Formerly the Transportation Advisory Committee. They used to meet in May. We're not able to do that this year because of COVID. They will be meeting now as necessary. And the things that they've looked at previously is the one hour delay, a 90 minute delay, doing a two hour delay, um, and they, they weigh the benefits of each. They look at um, how many closings and delays that we have every year. You will see the list here. Last year, before we left in March, we actually had zero closings and only four delays. And this group is made up of a number of different community members as well as students and staff. So here's where it gets a little bit trickier than if we were operating in a normal year. The delay process for us at 90 minutes is a challenge because we are only planning to have students in the building at this particular time for half day increments. So by the time we get them in 90 minutes late, they're really only there for a short amount of time. Our plan will be that for inclement weather days, we would eliminate during COVID and during our 50% capacity that delay schedule. Instead, we would resort to virtual learning for that day. That is going to be, as you have all mentioned, dependent on our final school schedules, and those are not 100% complete yet. As they are, we are going to clearly communicate what the plan will be for 50% return to the buildings in terms of inclement weather. This will go to students, to staff, to parents. We anticipate that as we mentioned, there will be an option for all closed. That will be our red day. And those are the days that we don't believe that we will adequately be able to get everyone online to be able to do learning. The other option is our virtual learning day. 
students and teachers would maintain their regular schedule online. And then we have to look at our support staff. The code blue, it's up to you what support staff will need to be able to be at the buildings and not work remotely that day. So those are some of the things that we're still um, with the schedule and as soon as it is determined what will be finalizing. So we just want everyone to know that there is um, a lot of information and a lot of data collection that goes into a decision every day as to whether we are going to delay, whether we are going to close, whether we are going to virtual learning. And we're always thinking about the safety, utmost safety of both students, staff, and their families. Okay, any other questions? So I mean, we have a lot of information coming to you as far as Checkers, temperature range, and weather. And others. So it all, it's, all these people report to chief operating officer? No. No. Okay. No, they report to our transportation department. So Margaret Ellen and her team at the warehouse are the ones that are collecting this. Okay. With their expertise and their decisions and all of the information, then their next call is to me. We discuss the information, and then the final call would go to the superintendent, and she would make that decision when available. <clears throat> and she made that decision today? No. This morning, no. Who made it? You did? Yes. If a decision is made, and somebody is there somebody that can say, well, no, I changed my mind? No. Once we start the process of rolling out this information. So therefore, no one can stop the wheel when it starts. Correct. Correct. We start to notify many families. There are a couple different tiers of notifications that start to go out in School Messenger, but there are a multitude of families that will be getting that first round of calls, and at that point, it is too late to stop. It, and maybe this is for a later discussion today, but if we have two groups, uh, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and two separate groups, and so we have buses going back and forth to get them uh, into the classroom. What would be the worst possible time for uh, a closure of school? It would be probably right at, right at uh, the lunch break. Yes, midday would be the hardest because you're trying to get morning students home and also trying to stop the process of starting your afternoon what? students. What are the chances of losing a child? The child goes this way, gets on the wrong bus. There's a lot of confusion. It's the first time we do this. Uh, you mean in terms of get, the child gets a on fifty percent capacity and, and the return and, but and the difference there? Because they're leaving early and there's everybody trying to get on a bus at the same time. I, you know, I don't know. It's been a long time since I got on a bus. Right. Our bus routes don't change, and neither do the drivers. So therefore, the safety protocols that we have in place are in place even during any type of inclement weather. You hear that? Absolutely. In all these years I've been on, there's only been a couple of times that. This process kind of didn't work because basically it's because of the weather. All of a sudden it cleared up. We got a million emails yes. as to why were you closed, why are you closed, like no, weather. I'll give you one better. So, the one snow event that happened all of a sudden, kids yeah. were in school, they were at lunch, right. and we had close to two inches fall very quickly. From the time you can even mobilize and buses. By the time we even mobilize, I remember the that. building, it was really hard. Yes. 2013, off. all of a sudden it just started snowing. Yes. And then we, 14. You know, but you have a good, they have a real good system, Mark. And, yes. And to communicate what happened, they, you know, they have a system for that. We had a tornado warning. So they were all in the building inside the, you know, hunkered down. And, and, say and everything came, started late. So we had to notify all the parents that <clears> they were, yes. kids were coming late. And there are times that that has happened with large rain events that we have had to delay buses. That even happens with traffic. So oh, if there's there's the something closes. that happens, yeah. yes, yeah. if the bridge closes, there are times that our buses are delayed and school messenger is utilized. I got to give them that credit out. though. They do a fabulous job with all these circumstances. Thank you. Our transportation really department puts yeah. a lot of work in this and a lot of early mornings. I can't remember. Do you pay the um, observers? There is a small stipend. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Good. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, current action items, athletic trainer. So uh, do I have a motion 
to approve MOU uh, for a certified athletic trainer at fiscal impact dollar amount of $60,000 budget source FY 2021 operating budget. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a second? Second. Questions, comments, discussion? Ms. Pullen. Yes. So we are asking for approval of the MOU between Queen Anne's County Public Schools and Bayside Physical Therapy to provide uh, athletic training services at both of our high schools. They will provide a certified athletic trainer at each high school location for up to 30 hours every week. The trainers are going to be the supervision for any treatment of athletic injuries and conditions. They'll provide basic care and instruction to staff. They'll also look at prevention and care of injuries. The specification sheet that was attached outlines that there are many other duties that may be expected by the school system in their time with us. Okay. And whoever is doing that is certified and they yes. have liability. I mean, we have it, but they also have liability insurance and we've checked all That's the correct. appropriate ways. We have. The MOU is attached to the, the presentation. Who do these certified uh, personnel report to? They actually report to, they, they work on site with our athletic directors, but they are um, under the parent company of Bayside Physical Therapy, so they report directly to them, but they work alongside our athletic um, directors. Raising that question because, you know, an injury on the field, uh, the child, uh, the athlete will want to say, well, I'm okay, coach, I'm okay. And the doctor will look and say, well, I'm not sure about that. And the coach says, well, if you can play, go in. That's why we have the athletic trainers on site Just because they help the to, yep, they help to bridge that. The college had a death because somebody couldn't treat somebody for. Uh, well, it's all included in here. It's in their MOU. And just to, for, since we don't have a CFO here, I will answer our own question. Athletic trainer is listed under page 19 and in instruction. It has been budgeted as part of the 2021 budget. Thank you. Okay. So any other questions, comments, discussion? Games, we will still have DES emergency services on yes. site. Okay. Yes, correct. And our athletic trainers are present for home games. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the, uh, on the motion to approve the MOU for certified athletic trainer, fiscal dollar amount $60,000, budget source FY 2021. Operating budget, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it, the motion is carried. Okay, uh, next item, the information item, early voting at Kennard Elementary School. This one is me as well. <coughs> oh, as you know, uh, we were scheduled with the elections board to utilize Kennard Elementary School for early voting, and this happened some time ago. The elections board included Kennard Elementary School in all of their advertising. Because of that process, it was very difficult to slow down at this particular time. We have received some concerns about having students and staff in the building at the same time that we have the voting public. The school specifically had some concerns about the idea that voter traffic would also be intermingling with school bus traffic. And it was necessary to use that bus loop parking area at the school because that affords our best ADA accessibility. The election board is only going to be utilizing the gymnasium. So there is an exterior entrance, there is an exterior exit that goes straight to the parking lot. So there won't be a necessity for them to ever be in any other parts of the building. There will be no intermingling with um, staff. They are confined to that gymnasium only. To accommodate the early voting, and I will give much credit to the school, they have arranged to have virtual instruction for the small groups that are there from October 26th to October 29th. There is a small population of students that will need in-person instruction. They really need to be with their teacher every day. And Kennard Elementary School has relocated them to Centerville Elementary School for the week. So at this point, there will be no students on site during the early voting time. Possibly we still will have staff that will choose to work in the building instead of remotely. The staff will utilize the parking area that is along Little Kidwell Avenue, enter through that entrance so there will never be a time that we'll have voters or our staff members that are anywhere in the same vicinity. Um, never any intermingling. And we felt safe with this option. I believe the school is feeling very good about this and the elections board was uh, very happy to be able to maintain their plan. 
I mean, you said they're going to be contained. They'll be using bathrooms. Only, so we won't open that to the public for voters. It will only be the elections judges, and they will only be utilizing the space in the kitchen area, and then it'll be sanitized at the end of each night. So it won't be an intermingling of use with our staff. I mean, I'm, I'm, you're probably not the one that made the decision, but to me, I don't know why. I mean, the board didn't know about it, but why we would have it at a school. I know we have our schools on election day. They're shut down. We've done that traditionally for a long time. But why in the devil we sit there and have it for a week in our schools with everything else going on when the Vincent Center has election board, that's where early voting took care of last year, and they had election there for the Central Town Council. They're having it at the firehouse on Ken Island. I don't know who made the decision, but I would not agree with it. I don't know what the rest of the board thinks about it. Yes. Well, and I, I do It's understand. done now, and thank God that we, we all the, everyone I, I, has made concessions and, and, and making sure the students are safe and, yes. and still providing a service to the public for the early voting. As far as the, student, the uh, staff goes, is it going to be optional for them to come? I, too, am very concerned, in particular, with the controversies with... Um, you know, the political controversies right. that there could be armed people right outside the voting booth trying to cram their way in there. And I was very concerned about that. I'm so happy they got the kids out. I was not going to be be agree with that at all. We should never have our kids in school when we do when we have voting, and, and especially this year. Um, so my question is, I would hope that the staff is going to have the option to be in there or not, because I won't, don't want any of our people at risk of um, any kind of an incident that may occur with this election. Sure, and I don't have the answer for that. I can talk with uh, the principal of the school, but I believe that that was part of the concession there, that she would allow her staff to work remotely as well. Okay. Thank you. Because this is a school being used, is Sheriff's Department or Centerville Town Police going to be kind of cruising through? I mean, I don't know why they're not using the Vincent Building like they have in the past or what that decision was about, but will there at least be patrolling to make sure the school is safe and looked after if personnel will not be in the school? It, personally, I have not had conversations with them, but I will definitely look into that and I will talk with the elections board about that because I'm not sure what type of security measures that they have looked into. Okay. From my experience, I, I was a chief judge for a few years, and my experience in if if you did have an incident, um, the police were there right away. But I, I understand what you mean. I mean, I was going if we were gonna have anyone in the school and that could not be turned around, I was I was gonna recommend we have a, a sheriff there the entire time, which locks them up for the week um, of this election. Well, so, I think the local sheriff that has done amazing jobs when you've had elections, but not contested, but even local elections, people putting signs in the wrong place, two groups, one singing, one not singing, just something. So, I, you know, there's been small instances, but I've always seen the Sheriff's Department, you know, do ride throughs and stuff. And so I, I'm not really concerned about that. I just, I just, I'm, I'm bewildered of why or who, um, you know, it's, it's, you know I, I, I like helping people out, but there's so many other places to have early voting, not necessarily in a school, and especially with anything else going on. Right. I do understand your concerns. Thank you. Thank you for yes. providing with that report. Any other questions? Okay. We're on 4.02 grants. I, d um, I actually have some questions of Carla. Okay. Not not relation to that, to this. Um, to what are you talking um, just a couple of things I wanted to know, get it updated for the public of what, um, since we have some people here that can help us with answering some okay. questions from the well, public. Well, let's, uh, when would that, we fit that in? As, as we're talking about all of this. Okay. Okay, I'll wait if you want. That's good. Thank you. Right. So we received, um, I have gave her one copy of the, um, we received the information for the grant expenditures um, since we don't have a CFO yet. Um, we can ask Ms. Pullen about the supplies that are on the expenditures. I had questions about um, have we received all the supplies that we need for the sanitizing? It's 
one of mine. Thank you. Okay. That's well, same, that's why I said um, we're leading into all of this. Okay. Thank so, you. Um, do we have the Senate? Yes. We, we yes. Talked back. So on. at this point, we're 100 percent ready to open buildings. What we are doing is continuously replenishing our stock, and what we don't know at this point is how quickly the burn rate is going to go once we have 50 percent of our students back in the building. So that's what we're preparing for now. We are ready to open buildings, but we are going to have a stockpile of all of our essential PPE and cleaning supplies so that we have something to pull from in the event that any school or any building runs out of that product or starts getting low. And all our machines are in for each school to... Yes, sanitize. yes. So we have all of our sanitizing machines. Um, they're in use in a number of buildings already. We had a very, very thorough meeting with our lead custodians as well as our principals and our nursing staff last Friday to go over all of the cleaning protocols that will be in place as well as the checklists that will be in place for daily use as well as the inspections. And we are ramping up the inspections of the building on a number of different fronts to make sure that we're seeing something that may be going wrong and we're addressing it very, very quickly. If certain things that we have a long, sh this is just a suggestion, just a suggestion, not anything. With so things that have long supply life or a shelf life. Yes. Can we get a, a good supply, even though you might officially do it for 30 or 60 days in the past, go farther, it's something we're gonna use. Hopefully this thing could go away, but it's not going away tomorrow. And just, you know, just in case something does happen with supply chain, we have a little cushion. Yes, so that's what we're trying to do with the CARES ESSER portion of the grant right now and the available funds that are left with that. At some point, we hope to hear about the new grant information and what monies will be available to us for PPE and cleaning on that front. But yes, our idea, we don't anticipate that we will stop using masks or that we won't need hand sanitizer or that we won't need disinfectant for quite some time. So having those items in stock is definitely what we're trying to do. Yeah. So on the Esther side of it, we have approximately, if I'm seeing this correctly, about 140,000 left That's at the correct. bottom of this. Okay. That's going to go fast. It's going to go really fast. So uh, can I ask, uh, on this Daycon, yes. Mr., is that one Mr. at 8,700? Or is that several? That would be several. Okay, thank um, you. I believe they were in the uh, area the, the of... The amounts didn't, weren't on here. Okay. Yes, the quantities aren't shown, but that's several. And I see signs, so there's guideline signs that are going to be put up in each, which is something that was requested by the... There are signs. There are exterior signs that we have, sandwich board signs. Mm -hmm. What we are currently in the process, and what some of the schools have opted to do on their own is to do some floor signs as well as taping areas, as well as posters or other things just to augment. For the, for the children to be able yes. to stand here, yes. you walk here. Okay. Yes, and a lot of that is dependent upon their program. You had a question on the chemicals from one of the parent um, yes. teachers, actually. Yes. The ones used to clean the rooms during transition times are very toxic, and the warning label is very comprehensive. Is this any hazard at all to the staff or students who interact? So we've talked about this a little bit. One of the things that's difficult in this process is that we need a chemical that will be able to kill the COVID virus and that has been EPA certified to do so, but also that is strong enough to do that. Um, what I can say about our disinfectant is that number one, it's part of our green cleaning program and we have to maintain our green cleaning program while we disinfect. So it's a benefit that the product that we already use in our buildings is both on that EPA compliant list as well as um, allowing us to use it for both cleaning and disinfection. It is the same green cleaning program that is used in a number of different hospitals and health facilities in our local area. So given that that is what the hospitals and clinical areas utilize as well as the National Institutes of Health in some of their, their spaces, um, we feel that for the COVID virus, this is the best option for us to use. And is that what we purchased from DACON? That's under correct. Here? It just says disinfected. It doesn't yes. describe what it is. You're okay. referring to the 404. 404, which yes. is okay. hospital grade. 404 is hospital grade. It's hospital and, and, grade. You know, a lot of these chemicals, everybody puts warning labels to cover themselves on it because there's liability issues. I'd be interested to read a Lysol can and see what's on. It's what, very what, similar. What's, it's, mm -hmm. So a Lysol can might have a similar thing what we're reading, and yes. people use Lysol like it's... 
the, you know, everything. So, you know, I mean, we need well. to be cautious. I, I don't blame anybody worrying about their children and their own, but I think we got to step back at some point and say, you know, Lysol, a lot, you know, you just don't drink it. Okay, I need to, I have a couple more things. Yeah. So um, I want to thank you again and Mr. Tom Walls for allowing Mr. Smith and I to go through Southersville Elementary School. I see on here sneeze guards. Yes. There were some in those classrooms, and I understand one set was made by a parent. They were, they were just lovely. I mean, perfect size for the students. It was so um, the sneeze guards we saw in Southersville Elementary School, are, are these the ones here from the G, DGS retail? No, there are some that we have actually purchased for special education, and they've requested more, as well as some of our elementary schools for their pre-K and kindergarten areas. They use tables right now instead of desks, so they've asked for some assistance with dividers, and we're looking into that. Um, we're hoping that with the lead times, we'll be able to get those quickly enough. If not, if you'll recall, we're only going to be able to have half of the furniture or utilize half of the furniture in a space that we currently do. And the secondary plan will be to take that furniture and move it into those areas for the smaller groups. So those one dividers that we saw that were just... The big X. That was made by a parent, but there was another spot where we just, they were just like this, sitting in a spot, and then they were gonna move them from A yes. day to B day, using utilizing that one. Steve, can we get more of those? Yes, we can, and that's what we're looking into getting now. That, that is what seems to be the best for the elementary schools to utilize at the tables, the rectangular tables, so that they get a full six feet, but as protection. But you had mentioned well, during our trip, during our walking around Southern Elementary School, that plexiglass is very hard to get right now, so yes. everything's on back order. Everything's, there are back orders, and mostly the plexiglass that we utilized for um, the guards at our main office areas, for our nurses stations, for our cafeteria. Um, plexiglass itself is hard to get. There are a lot of places now that are fabricating these different types of dividers. So we do have, we've been able to check prices. We've been able to get some, some better pricing than what we had originally hoped. Well, that's on my list too. The question uh, if, I, I, I think we ought to consider um, doing it for all of these classrooms, um, not just certain ones. And I know that that's, I mean, I, I think it's important. It will cover some of the concerns too that the the association had. You know, they had a great checklist and it sounds like we're checking things off of that list. This would be a good one too. And it would alleviate a lot of the concerns and a lot of the letters and emails we're getting from teachers. Yes, we can certainly look into that. And you could actually start it at, at the elementary level, which I think, I mean, I'm, I don't know from what I've observed that is the biggest concern right now. Is the right, that's where it sounds to be the most appropriate for you. And another item was um, I attended the, the, the MAP um, annual conference and Dr. Salmon spoke and she talked about an innovation in the schools that she's gone to see. And they've actually put up some of these plexiglass separations for the kids to actually eat lunch together but not be mm -hmm. at each other. And they're doing that in the cafeterias. I'm not saying do it, but it's a, that's a neat it's idea. Yeah. great ideas to come in to, to, to students to feel more like it's an actual day of school. Yeah, that's, that's well, a great suggestion. Well, the divider that we were talking about was actually, it, for a round table, it was it was across like this so that four students could sit at a table together oh, great. and still see each other. And, oh, they were lovely. Uh, I mean, I would love to find someone who can manufacture those. On. Well, that could be a, a project for our carpentry class. Yeah. I see our, our community our, service and... Our lovely Mrs. Fellers is in the back. has got her hand up. What's up? So, I'm really Harris College School Health Services Coordinator for the Public and the Board. Come on up. It is a great innovation, and they were amazing. I do think to see them. The only concern to keep in mind is that it doesn't match the CDC guidance that they need to be facing all the same direction. Oh. They're all facing each other. Oh. So it's no. great for lunchtime, but not for instruction. Or sneezing, and they're fa it's. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. It is a great, it, they're, they're wonderful. So it, say oh. again, I'm sorry, we, we, we couldn't do that. So the divider that goes like this, they're all facing each other. They want the them CDC all. recommendations and some of the other um, uh, guidances that we utilize recommend that in a classroom, they're all, the children are all facing the same direction. So that if there is a cough or a sneeze or a child who's not wearing the mask properly, it's going this way as opposed oh. to 
Oh. All of them going at each other. So just keep that in mind. It is a great, it is a great thing. I, I did see them. But the, the cubby style you you described is that what's being used in like computer labs? Or this was just one particular classroom that every every round table had this. It allows more students to it be in It allows the classroom. social interaction that they, they, they get to, yeah. you know. I, I but mean, the cubby style, I mean, if I remember from computer lab, and from what I've seen, they're long tables. They're not single units. So are they using we saw, those we cubby We did style? see some single so, units, like the cubby that you're talking about. Yeah, and then so we saw the computer ones labs that, can still be used. Are they, are they doing something like that for computer science or those classes? So at this point, we haven't had any requests. So I, I don't know exactly how the secondary schools are handling their computer labs. Okay. This has been the requests that we've gotten have been from um, elementary schools, and mainly because they know that for long periods of time, having someone sit still is probably not going to be as feasible. So they're using them for individual use for the little ones. Okay. And I know this isn't part of our um, agenda, but Ms. Feller's here to give us the update on health metrics yes. this week. That's great. But let okay, me know what. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> okay, I'm done with you. I know Captain Day, I got the You're not done. Right. You're not done. <laughs> We're a team anyway. That's right. That's right. We all are. Uh, so what would you like me to start with? Do you want me to start with the county's health metrics? Go right ahead. So for, uh, you know, I, I've been checking the metrics daily and communicating with um, several of the health department co um, counterparts. They've been wonderful. Um, to run the numbers um, and, and to share what the numbers mean, um, because oftentimes they will access the information before I'm able to get it. So just in the last 15 to 20 days, um, well, the metrics that we use, let me, let me back up. The metrics that we use are the positivity rate and the new case rate per 100 cases. Um, these are the positivity percentage and the new case rate are metrics that were passed down to us from Maryland Department of Health um, with the approval of MSDE, the Maryland State Department of Education, uh, to make our determinations on do we stay virtual, do we proceed to hybrid, can we go fully into the school buildings. And so... Sorry, what, 100 new cases per 100? Well, per 100,000. Thousand, okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and I'm going to... 100,000 people in the county, right? 50,000. Or what do you mean? That's how many people we have in the county, 50,000. Yeah, but I mean, new cases, yeah, that's, I'm trying to figure out what the 100,000 is. So. You better check that amount because I think it's gone up. It's, I think I've been using 50. I bet it's closer to 15 most in the yeah, 100, I can guarantee you. Uh, it's 100,000 people? That's what that's the metrics they're using. They need a the rate per 100,000. We just don't have to have that. I'm pulling up um, the, uh, bear with me. I wish I, I, I would like to pull it up there, but I have to log in and it's okay. It's okay. Um, so, uh, let me pull this up if I can. The percentage uh, for Queen Anne's County, the positivity percentage rate from October 2nd through current has um, continued to increase. The, the biggest movement has been from October 5th through October 20th, where we have steadily climbed from 2.08 and we currently sit at 4.33. Um, I'm, again, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to pull this um, guidance up because the guidance se is for seven up. days. Is that seven days? Yes, that's a seven day. Yes, it's a rolling, mm -hmm. rolling number. Uh, the guidance from Maryland Department of Health says that if we are at five percent or less, or less than five percent, excuse me, then we can consider full return, we can consider um, moving from hybrid to 50% capacity, if we, and keeping in mind the new case rate as well. So we have to meet these two criteria. So if we're greater than 5%, then the recommendations from MDH and MSEE is that we stay the course. Uh, and then if the new case rate is high, then we remain at virtual. So for the new case rate, so we're, we're at 4.33, for the percentage of positivity. And then for the new case rate, 
we're currently at 9.92. So the health department, our health officer, has given us some, some guidances on our numbers. So if we are, if, if the new case rate is less, is five or less, five or less, then we can consider full return to the school buildings. We can um, you know, have the hybrid thriving. If we go b from five to 15, we would, cons we would consider the 50%. Right, so we're hanging out at 9.92 right now. If we go above 15, it's everybody virtual. Nobody in the buildings. So we have had a steady climb for the new case rate from the fifth, sixth, and seventh from 5.1 to 6.24, all the way up to now where we're at 9.92. We have not dipped, it's been a steady rise, more than 14 days. And off the top of my head, I apologize because I can't remember what the governor's guidances were, but I know that when they're looking at it, they look at those 14-day chunks of time, the making 14? decisions. Oh, okay, so I thought they went from seven to 14 and then came back to seven, but. Yeah, the data is reported in seven days, but they're using a 14 days. 14, we don't okay. want to make decisions too quickly, you know, just because the, day, the numbers change over a couple of days. They want to see a pattern or a trend. And it also makes it better for the parents than to, to plan. Know, make it every seven days something, you know. Correct. All right. So there have been definitions of what, you know, an outbreak is for a cohort in a classroom in a school so that we can kind of titrate the closures as opposed to closing an entire district, we can just close a school. You know, instead of closing a whole school, we can close a classroom or a cohort. Um, one of the things to keep in mind in your decision making um, is that we are moving into colder weather. And so all of those options that we had for outdoor um, activities, outdoor mitigation, with restaurants, with school, you know, we lose that. We lose that because now we're going to be forced indoors. Um, the other thing to consider is we have the holidays coming. And so despite, you know, our guidance is despite, you know, the science saying, hey guys, don't congregate, don't get together, don't travel across state lines. Um, it's in our nature to be with our families and to commune and to travel during the holidays. Uh, we are going to be in the thick of flu season. Right, that's... We are doing flu shots as we speak. Right, exactly. <laughs> so there's the flu, you know, flu season to keep in mind. Um, and also keep in mind too, our staffing shortages. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we're, you know, when we're considering our decisions, when we look at the metrics, and we please consider all those other items as well. Um, and I can share with you, I, I, you know, I don't know about the teachers, I don't know about the administrators, but I can, or the custodial staff, but I have exactly, I had exactly four substitute school nurses. Four what? Four substitute school nurses. That is all I have. And I just lost one who now is joining us full time. So I have three substitute school nurses. So should one of our nurses become ill or have to take care of an ill family member, we have three people to pick from. We might have to consider agencies or some other forms of staffing and recruitment, which Human Resources and I are. I was gonna, gonna say, do you have a- Brainstorm a, a, somewhere you Yep, can. publications, getting the word out, having our fellow coworkers share the info. How do you analyze the I guess the steps we take, the flu, someone has the flu, how do you decipher? Because we're saying they have a, I mean, you have to wait, I'm getting, a, they don't, we don't consider it a COVID case unless they've been tested and it is COVID, right? So you could test for COVID or you could test for the flu or you could test for both. Okay, okay, so we will Ill be able swabs. to know that mm -hmm. the, a child goes out with a, a bad throat and fever and all that. We, Which one it is. And so we cl don't immediately close, we test and then I think I'm talking to this place. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I just I wanted to clarify that because um, you know the flu is coming up. Um, well, and besides, I mean, you already have strep throat, but going around schools aren't even open. Yeah. Right. So strep test still has to happen. Still need to to rule out all those other things that would regularly happen. The other thing to consider as well in the decision making process is to look at the numbers in our neighboring. Uh, our neighbors, our neighboring counties, because as we all recognize, we are a transient population. We live here and some folks work in other counties. So in looking at the numbers, we don't want just want to look at our numbers, we want to look at the surrounding counties. So, um, you know, Dorchester's new uh, daily new case rate per 100,000 is currently at 30.9. Mm -hmm. 15 is our threshold to switch. Um, Dorchester is sitting at a positivity rate of 6.08. So they're already outside 
the scope of the parameters, at least set by Maryland Department of Health. Um, if you're looking at Somerset County, it's 27.88 for the new case rate. Um, the positivity test rate is 5.34. Um, if we're looking at, those are the two highest ones right now as our, you know, our, our closest neighbors. Um, Wicomico is at 18.2 for the new case rate and um, the positivity um, test rate is at 5.17. So our neighbors are already outside the threshold. Caroline County? Um, I can tell you. So Caroline County, the daily new case rate is 11.2 yeah. and their positivity test rate is at 5.7%. Uh, a contributing factor to that was they let uh, an elementary school in Greensboro open. Everybody social distanced. The children were too young to get the, the virus but the virus is all over them, everything, and the staff came down with it. Yeah, there were eight teachers that, that, that developed it over a span of days. So something else to consider, um, Captain Kelly and the board, um, is that, you know how we talk about pivoting all the time? The CDC released a new um, update today, and the update changes the definition of a close contact, which, Morissette and I literally just found out about an hour and a half ago. Um, well, actually, no, you were less, right? Less, because I was that, off today. I'm the one that told her about it. Um, so the CDC has expanded the definition of who is um, defined as a close contact, um, a close contact of an individual with COVID-19. And the impact of this new guidance, who's impacted for this new guidance? It's the schools, it's um, workplaces, it's group settings. So where people are in contact with others for long periods of time. Um, because more people are likely to be considered now at risk. So in the olden days of this morning, um, a close contact would be someone who, and I'll read it right from here. The, the CDC previously defined a close contact as someone who spent at least 15 consecutive minutes uh, within six feet of a confirmed coronavirus case. The updated CDC guidance released today now defines a close contact as someone who was within six feet of an infected individual for a total of 15 minutes over a 24 hour period. So in the olden days, if we had a potential or a confirmed person under investigation and in the school, we would start our contact tracing process and then we would expand it out to the health department and share our information with them. We were identifying maybe one or two or no close contacts. With this new definition, we're going to have an entire classroom right off the bat. We're going to have the bus. We're going to have every single teacher. That's just for the students. Let's now go to the staff. So it's it's 15 minutes. So you can be three minutes here with one secretary. Go away. You know, you're wearing your mask. You're doing your physical distancing. And then you come back and you're spending another eight minutes with that person later on in the day. And then another five minutes around the water cooler, et cetera, et cetera. And it's over a 24-hour period. So it's even including the day before. Are they, but are they considering the people are wearing masks when they do? So this is without masks. But it is most of the mask-wearing folks in our schools and in our workplaces are not trained in PPE to the level that a healthcare person would be. So they don't like to consider that as a part of the equation because we've seen many people who do not wear their masks properly and including children. So the what two of you sitting seat, here right what now. What is the seat, go ahead. Yeah, we, we as, as coworkers are really risking it. We as, we are, we're together a lot and, and it's been already over 15 minutes. That's what I'm saying. But, so. but we're physically distant and we are, you know. In contact tracing, our question is, have you spent any time, 15 minutes or greater, with somebody within six feet for more than 15 minutes without a mask? That's our specific question. Okay, that's the question I want to hear. Is that without question's a mask. going to change now. Have you spent 15 minutes over a 24-hour period with anybody, but it's still going to be without a mask on our side of it? Right, your side, yeah. The school side, that may be a different story because they are wearing masks. And they should be socially distanced. Right. The, the but children do not socially distance on their own. And keep in mind still the trend that right now across the U.S. we're seeing 75% uh, of the country right. having the increase in numbers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Mr. So just keep those, those things in mind. Question. Okay. Yes. 
CDC metrics calculation for this county uh, suggests that we can start a virtual mask deal. Uh, what happens if the metrics change and they go up? Do we now close the schools? And so, why, so and the, why our start health officer on? has given us has given yeah. us um, those guidances on the metrics. Are we yes. going to treat the high schools, middle schools, uh, elementary schools, and preschools alike? Are they going to be have to be changed how they're being treated? I'm not sure what, I don't know what you're talking what do you about. Mean? Well, do you mean um, they had social distancing in Greensboro, and the staff came down with the COVID 14 days after they started. It's but we don't know they didn't close the whole, the whole school system. They just closed Greensboro. All I'm saying is that we have a responsibility to the people that work for us, and we have responsibility to the parents that not start something and then have some metric that nobody understands tell us we got to shut it back down again. Uh, um, yeah. It is a concern, and it is a possibility. Any, I don't want anybody to get sick on my watch, but, you know, uh, the first obligation is to your teachers and your staff. The second obligation is to the students uh, and the parents. If we get a whole bunch of people sick. I see them all the same, sir. It's, I, I, I worry I'm about all of them equally. You your mask. <laughs> the students, the staff, and the kids. Thank you. All equally. <laughs> okay. That we're doing everything we can do, and that I understand. But this is a sneaky virus, and that's why it's still around. And that's why we have situations. I, I asked uh, Michelle, well, why don't we open up the elementary schools? You know, they don't seem to get the virus. She I, said they carry it. And look what happens. Okay. We, I, we understand. Well, one thing I heard, you said you're down to only three, uh, te or te three nurses that are on, you could call in right now. Are we, Ms. Bass, are we doing things as far as outreaching to how to get more people that will have that too? And then I can ask the next question, even with long-term subs and people, are we actually looking? Because, I mean, this is going to be an issue. Somebody's going to go out. Somebody's going to have an issue. we got to replace people. So we're getting out of the scope of what this was actually about. This well, is has to she brought, up, she brought up the fact When are we going to have this discussion, though? I have questions about that, too. So we needed to have a little bit of it today well okay At here, least here's where something. we stand so far we got, we got a lot to discuss you know we've gone over some nice things this evening but we were opening schools and a lot of, I'm getting a lot of emails which, which I'm sure are you are and questions we're not answering and we need some answers to these things and I'll say it right now we need to have a meeting next Wednesday and yeah, because we're not getting enough answers right now and be able to get out to the public, to both teachers and the public. Okay, so let us finish with the health metrics right now, which mm -hmm. by the way, I really do need to add an agenda item. Uh, do I have a motion to uh, amend the agenda to include 4.03 report on health metrics? So moved. Second. Second. Questions or comments and discussion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to amend the agenda, agenda to include report on health metrics. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. All opposed say no. Ayes have it. Motion is carried. Thank you. I need to clarify that as far as keeping our agenda. We do not have an agenda item at the moment to discuss reopening of schools. Okay. I'd like to move that we have 4.04. Um, reopening schools as to where we are at this moment with the staff that we have to respond. Make the motion, please. Okay. That's what I said. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? What's the motion? I didn't hear what the motion was. The more motion is to amend the agenda to include 4.04, the reopening of schools. Discussion on reopening of the schools. Oh. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Okay, so 4.04. I, I want to go on record. I oh, don't you said agree no. with oh. opening the schools. We are having a discussion, Mr. Anderson, oh, I, I on started getting the answers to some questions that everyone is asking us about. The motion to go into hybrid, sir, on November 9th has already been made and voted upon. It's that you said, do not agree with it is noted. It was right now, no, you're wrong. I am it not wrong. It, yes, well, you're the chair, so you're uh, never wrong. Right now, I'm right. The, well, so the, right the, now, we are having a question and answer session. on metrics. Yeah. That, sir, it was a part of the motion. Yes. That was a part of the motion. There's no denying that. 
It's a part of the motion, and we have discussed the health metrics. Right now, there are some questions the board members have and within I, the scope yes. of who can answer them only. Right. That's it. Right, got it. So ask your question. And so it's contingent on hearing those questions answered. No, yes. sir. Yes, well, that's what I'm he sorry. said. I'm sorry, what? What are you asking the, the market? Uh, I'm saying what that what we decided two weeks ago is predicated on metrics of health and they are going up they change if we make a decision now to start and i know we have to if we are going to make that decision we have to have lead time but there are a bunch of issues that we don't have the answers to and uh, my colleague uh, has said that we need to find answers to these things so why tell the public we're going to do it when we don't have the answers to the questions. Okay, well, right now we we're don't gonna... have answers to give to our negotiated friends. Well, we're, right, right now, yeah. we would like to ask some questions. Yeah. Therefore, Is that okay with you? Can we ask questions? Therefore, the motion should not be made until we ask and get the answers. Motion is well, just the, to talk. Right now, questions. it is just to have some questions asked about reopening of schools. We have already made the decision to open up hybrid on number not number, so, sir. That is done. You unless say it's done, and I'm health, saying it's not done because the metrics the, weren't met. Let me please finish, no. Mr. Mr. <laughs> Anderson. Let me finish. According to health metrics, that was a part of the motion. Right now, we'd like just to ask some questions for the people sitting here. So let them please ask some questions. Mr. Smith, would you like to ask a question? We mentioned that we're short on nurses, or not short on nurses, we have nurses leaving and sickness or other issues. I'm saying to Mrs. Bans, do we, you say we have three that we can call, but I could drop to one, two, we could be in a problem. Same as long-term subs, I'm just asking, do we have some kind of, are we working on addressing some of these issues? And by no means am I asking a question, if somebody feels uncomfortable answering at this meeting, I certainly will have them needing it in so a week from me, now. Let me rephrase that in, in, in a better, a different way. Have the principals reported to you their need for long-term subs? Mike, my question is, and, and just to clarify, we're, I know that the schools and the school system are working on answering all these questions, but you know it's not been very long, so I understand that we didn't have full full decisions on things. It's just a list of things that people are wondering what's going on. Um, so, my question on on that is, I, I just have a list of things, and if for some reason the folks that are here, it hasn't been resolved yet, then the answer is it hasn't been resolved yet, and I'm good with that. Just so the public knows that it's on on the agenda to be be handled. That's why I wanted to ask some of my questions. And the answer maybe you don't know yet. But so my question I had was um, a little bit to do with that, but now I know that. You're, they're working on it. The principals have come to you with what they need. I know the schools, all the schools haven't come up with decision, full decisions on who's going to be virtual, who's going to be teaching, who's going to be. So with you, I was asking, the, I know the um, FMLA it expires the end of the year to have an emergency family leave right with emergency family leave as part of the cares act that so when we get closer and closer there hopefully there'll be some decision made how we the teachers can and staff can carry it past that so, and that's a question they're all asking or some are asking <laughs>
ิดมาเป็นแบบเทคนิคเทคนิคมีอกับเทคนิคในการเงินในการเทรดในการทำธุรกิจในการเงินในการเงินในการเทรดในการเทรดในการเทรดในการเทรดในการเทรดใ That's for that's very important. Thank yes. you. That's good for the public. She was on a roll. Leave her alone. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, do I need to repeat any of that? Because I'm kind of living with it, so I, I really know it. Um, we, Sounds like it. Yeah. We um, have sent out surveys, commitment to most people, and they are being absolute honest with us. You know the problems that we had with hotspots and and technology. Well, some people don't live in the areas that is going to afford them enough bandwidth to do the sub lesson. So those, some of those subs are willing to come into the building, and and we talk about that, what that would look like. Um, but what we had to do, which I, you may not know or understand, I had to cluster the subs for contact trade. So we have day-to-day -day subs, Captain Kelly. So they might go to Kelly High School today. Then they go over to Vanessa High School the next day. But we are north and south, east and west. So it was going to make it very difficult for me to know who the day-to-day -day sub came into contact. So we featured or clusterized so you could pick four schools. So this year, subs will have to pick, whether they day-to-day -day or long-term, what region they want to dedicate their services to. Good because job, job. because it'll make it much easier for us to, God forbid, we do have to do something different with the way we operate schools. Then I know where Vanessa has been. I, she was at this school, she taught this class, or a close contact of hers had COVID or tested for COVID, and we have to isolate a certain group. That was really important. It's a little bit different this year. You just can't pick, I, I want to go all over the county. Because we have some day-to-day subs that actually, if they wanted to, they could work all 189 days, day to day, day to day. But most people pick the area they're most familiar with and the te teachers and the kids they like. They do. People just have choices. Or oh, I want to be close. I, I want to be close and if anything happens with my kid or either I'm subbing in my kid's school, well, you got to stay in that area this time. So that may limit their opportunities to sub because you don't have the same absentee rate at all of the schools. But we are totally in HR committed to this. I am running numbers on people who have health conditions. I am getting for the regular um, accommodation 
I got several of them right here, all counted. I called them before I came down. I let them know that they um, had been approved for accommodation. It will be backed up by email. Actually, it's already These been These the sent ADA, out. pending ADAs? Uh, right, they're not even pending. I have approved okay. them. Okay, because we heard um, that some were pending. And they're well, they were pending nervous. because mm -hmm. doctors are inundated mm -hmm. with the ADA forms. So depending on when you got in line to get the doctor to fill it out, so I can't approve it until I get a doctor's signature because it is not arbitrarily just approved. Um, it's certain things that um, I get sentences. I don't want to share. It's rather sensitive because it's a health issue, and I don't want to violate HIPAA. But there's certain things that I say yes to automatically. I, I, I just do. But some of the other requests, they might have to do a different type of leave because those people who have tenure, they can take extended FMLA. They just can't take the CARES FMLA. So as soon as I get doctor notes, I approve them. Okay. If I could just interject, and this might be an unpopular opinion, but to address um, Mr. Smith's question of what, what are we doing or what can we do, um, I was in a meeting this morning with um, my cohorts of the other school health services coordinators, and there are um, other counties, um, for example, Frederick County, who um, they approved um, premium hazard pay for retention. Do what? Premium hazard pay for retention. I know, right? The eyes get really big. <laughs> uh, but you ask, you ask that question. So. I mean, to try to get people in, but then you know, you had regular people who were not doing that too. So we got to be consistent and fair. When you, yeah, it was just mentioned, and I would say that would be something that would have to be explored, and that is above my pay grade and not my purview. But that is in our discussions this morning with the other school health services coordinators. That was brought up that they, for example, Frederick County says they're not having any problems with staffing because they've enacted premium hazard pay for people who are willing to work in the school building. Mm. Something to consider. What is your job? I a couple I have is Ms. Bass was um and questions we've been getting um on many emails. If they test positive, do they use their sick days? No, remember that's what I said. Yeah. If they test positive, it could be a 10 to 14 day window right. um, that they are off. It's COVID-19 leave. We have it coded in the system. And anybody that has been down that particular road, they know that they don't have to use their own. It does not go against their time whatsoever. Nothing, yet. okay. Um, are they forced to quarantine due to the health of a student, family, coworker, but they still have to use their own sick days, or will they have the ability to switch to virtual? I mean, these are questions okay, they well have. That's but the, the code is so that that's, code. That's it, if they have stuff. to quarantine because of somebody else. That they are not punitive. They are it, not. They're not charged. No, they are not. It's not a punitive leave. Okay. Um, but the, the thing is, too, you're available. <laughs> all the time. So our teachers and staff have, have, have a personnel issue, which we're not, you know, it's, it's a fine line what we ask and what we don't, can come to you, email you, and, and you can get back them in a very timely manner to get an answer. Up to 11.59 at night. Mm -hmm. Then we need, the public needs to know that, and contact you if they have questions. They, the can teachers, really, they mean, really can contact me anytime. I do like to sleep a little bit, but um, I, I didn't because I knew you all was going to do that fog a lot. And when they can't, made it late, I said, well, I'm already here, so <laughs> I'll just keep <laughs> on sitting. But um, I usually, um, Captain Kelly, Ms. Anson, I answer my, Ms. Smith, I answer my own phone all the time if you've had an occasion to call me. I avail myself because I think communication is one of the most important things we go to school to learn as, as a former teacher. And I, I don't want to be responsible for not answering. If I don't answer, it's because I don't know that answer. And I don't mind saying, I don't have the answer, but I'll get back to you, usually before the close of business that day. But if I don't have the answer, I'll call them back and tell them I don't have the answer and I'm working on getting the answer. That's how my office operated and it has since I've been here because well, I, that's I, very important. I, I love to hear that because I think communication in this time is the most important thing to have. You know, you might not agree with it, might not like it, but at least you know the facts and not something going out here that's untrue and you can resolve the problem a lot quicker that way. And we're going to have some bumps in the road. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's going to be some issues we have. And, but I mean, I feel comfortable that we're doing with the staff. We got doing everything we can do to make this the most pl pleasant experience, but I'm and sure it, some people would I just want to say we'll just a, a reminder. Painless. <laughs> <laughs> I just want painless. To, she's a painless. 
That would be nice. <laughs> yeah, pay a little bit. I just want to remind you that this building, central office, and the warehouse can also have COVID leave. So t sometimes if people don't get directly back to you, they're out on COVID leave because we have had, it's starting in July, I think, Carla, you can probably correct me. Um, we had people who had close contact. And so sometimes if answers don't come right away, those people with the answers are out being quarantined. And if they are quarantined, some people will virtually teach. Some of the jobs in call a shop cannot be done through teleworking. But most of us that are doing something that with this that we carry around all the time, they will opt to telework. I haven't had anybody out on COVID leave that did not want to telework. Work. Okay. Oh, and that, that was one of the questions from the association. Teachers are allowed to teach virtually if they're sent home on self-quarantine. Yes. I don't have a virtual corral uh, because we we had uh, a virtual pilot in place. That's something so that we can ask I either. That's yeah. a principal's decision. Yep, I was going to tell you that. That is not HR. Any, that, yeah, that's not HR. HR. That's not under our purview. That is no, under it's the principal. I'm just wondering. Um, that should be directed to their principal. She, okay, we'll pass that because she, yes. you know, she did answer that question. That it, with that, but that, again, that is not in our lane. That belongs to the principal. They have to address that with, with Okay. Is we need him, to let his or the, her principal. And we need to let okay. the union president know okay. that. Okay. Well, <laughs> these questions go to well, we, principals. Well, uh, they, they, they think it comes from the central office, so just want okay. to clarify that. When will we know that we have sufficient staffing to start up the school? Well, every day that I get the comment back from either a doctor or they're taking we call it um, CARES Act number five, um, where they are asking to take leave. There is a, um, a numerical formula that goes on with that that impacts your salary. So if you just look at that, that will tell you why some people are changing their mind and making themselves more available um, to work because you don't want to impact your income by um, taking certain types of leave. But certain classifications of teachers can only teach certain subjects and you got to match the class to the available teacher it seems like you need a computer to keep all this handy uh yep this is that's so, why i live with this as i understand it the surveys are not completed yet at the schools and i'm, I'm just making that as a general that's what i'm wondering that was my question now, I, they as i understand it they have not been totally completed so you don't have a transportation report for us no I don't. okay and uh, we're not even going to try and speculate and ask you a bunch of questions because it's just there's not enough information right now. I can tell you one thing about the transportation is that this week the schools have done a fabulous job with the students that they yeah. take this off too. The students that they have that have committed to coming in or opting out, they have listed those and we are starting to plug them into bus routes and onto different buses. So far, um, the the numbers on the buses are looking very good, but it, it's far from complete. But at this point, it's encouraging that we'll be able to handle the 50% capacity uh, with the students who have responded. So is it fair to address Mr. Smith's motion? You wanna make your motion now? I think we make a motion that we uh, schedule a meeting next Wednesday the 28th uh, for more updates as we get more information on reopening of schools, we have we'll have bus issues. You know, I mean. Okay. Yeah. Make your motion. I make a motion. We uh, have a meeting next October the twenty eighth, next Wednesday. Work session. Work session, time. and we and we can get the schedule together. Uh, make the motion. I second the motion. Okay. The motion, as I understand it, is to um, have a work session on October twenty eighth. Any more questions, comments, discussion? You're happy with it. There we go. Discussion, Mr. Smith. I, I think we should have it. <laughs> I think it's an op I agree at the opportunity for us to um, get a further update because I know you're learning things as we go along yes. every, every day. And it, it provides an update to the parents, really, and, and the teachers, and teachers that want to know where we're going with this. Are you? Oh, I'm good. Miss Fellers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we'll talk to Dr. Kane. Okay. So I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? I have comments. Okay. 
Just for thought, I don't need an answer today, but these are thoughts that parents and teachers have all Can we come finish up with. the motion first? Can we finish the motion? Yeah. Okay. The motion is to have a work session for October 28th. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. And any board member can contact you as far as what it, questions we have and then yes. you can discuss it with the yes. superintendent. Yes, and then I'll send them on to Dr. Kane and she'll send it on to the staff. What? So these are just some concerns that we've gotten, countless of them, and I don't need an answer today, but just food for thought. Why not a full school day? You're coming Monday and Tuesday the full day. And that's brought up because CTEs, you're coming first and second this day, third and fourth this day. CTE, some of those are third and fourth period classes. So now you're splitting their time and they may not be getting their hours. So, and some kids, by the time you do the full bus ride for 45 minutes to an hour, it's not really worth coming in for just a few and still having to come home and try to get online on time. So just looking at a full day rather than half days. And then, Accordingly, changing the surveys to include thought for parents. We've got two full weeks before this should happen. Um, parents need to finalize what they're going to do. And the full day answers a question for daycare concerns for teachers and parents. Um, a big concern teachers have pointed out is lack of directions. Principals don't have answers for them. Michelle. They don't know what to plan. It's on. Oh. Get a little closer. A big complaint from staff and teachers has been lack of direction. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to plan. They don't know how to respond to, to parents. Well, this is all things that we need to put into an email and send on to Dr. Kane. And I have, and that's why I said I don't need an answer, just things to think on and plan on. Okay. And then the whole AAB day decision, how's the split and when will they know? That's been a big question. Is it alphabet? Is it nobody? Nobody can answer parents' questions on that, so it's just some thought process on that. And then the cleaning. Is the student doing it? Is the teacher doing it? What's, what are the expectations? What's happening with that 20 minutes? Are the students cleaning? Are they lingering in the hallway? Those big questions. So if, if those kinds of things could be answered when we meet next, that would clear up a whole lot of ambiguity on the, the behalf of teachers, staff, and parents. Well, a lot of that too would have to, the principals were taking on, would take on a lot of those questions. So hopefully the Tiger teams will be here giving us answers to that. Mm -hmm. Once, uh, hopefully all the surveys will be completed. Um, we'll get some answers from Dr. Kane and that would be helpful for all of us to meet again next Wednesday. Is there, is there and in that line too, I had two more things similar to what you're saying that have been major concerns is, and this could be resolved at the principal level, which we may learn that from the Tiger team, because is, is the ability for um, teachers to do the, vir every afternoon is virtual in all the schools. And can the teachers at, work it out with the principal to do the in-person in the morning and then go home for the virtual and do their virtual from home. They've had that asked a lot and that may be a decision at the local principal level and they just aren't getting advice from the Again, central that's, office. That is, I mean, we, we can ask that, but it is out of our line. So it definitely is the No, I'm just saying it's part of what can be briefed next week to let the public know. And again, that may be an individual principal decision. Right, and that I don't know. So okay. that's why I'm asking. All right, do we have any other questions, comments? We good? Go ahead. Where where do we stand on the, and maybe I do this, in, the replacements? For, you know, there's concern about people in the central office, the, the executive team in particular. That's not Mrs. Bass. That's, yeah. that's not, not Mrs. Bass' position. That's not Ms. Bass' question. But my question is, do we have replacements coming in, that's all. That's her question, right? That's a personnel. I think we need to leave that alone right now. Well, can, we we call for the, can we call for the vote? Okay. Um, no other questions, comments? We have future meetings now that we have October 28th. We have November 4th, November 18th. Um, nothing else on the agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to close, go into closed session? We need to vote on the 28th or since we're going to. We already did that. Did, okay. I, I do have one thing. What is FFCRA? Fricka? That's a family first. 
Recovery Emergency Act. That, that's the COVID, all that COVID that's I was talking COVID. about. And number, and number five is the one for um, people requesting to be off uh, for child care. Okay. Because their schools are either hybrid or closed. Family first COVID. Mm -hmm. I'll give you, I'll just give it to you. It's a lot yeah. to remember. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, <I'll> just, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I have, I have a motion to go into closed session. Yes, pursuant to general provisions of Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move that the board meet in closed session to discuss performance, evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials of whom this body has jurisdiction, or any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals, to consider matters related to negotiations, to perform administrative function, and consult with counsel for legal advice. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to go into closed session. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you all, and good evening. We'll close out in closed session. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Fellers. Thanks.